opening lines can be important. They are important. You remember uh, in school writing a writing papers, writing speeches. If you're like me, sometimes the the hard part was how do I even start this thing? Like if I could get started, I'd be okay. The opening lines are important. Some of them become very famous. See if you can tell what the following opening lines are from. Famous opening lines. I'll start with an easy one. You know this one? Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers, or our, excuse me, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. What's that from? Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln. Here's another easy one, even though you've maybe never read the book, what book starts like this? I am an invisible man. That is from The Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison. Uh, Maybe the, oh, here's a good one. This one gets thrown around a lot, this book, even though most people that throw it around probably haven't read it, but what book starts like this? It was a bright, cold day in April, and all the clocks were striking 13. Anybody? Anybody? It's 1984, George Orwell. Um, The most famous opening line in fiction probably is this one, Call Me Ishmael. Anybody? Moby Dick, good. Um, And then this one, I'll give you a hint for this one. It's, It's from a movie for people of, at least in the neighborhood of my age. What movie begins this way? The key to faking out the parents is the clammy hands. It's a good, non-specific symptom. I'm a big believer in it. A lot of people will tell you that a good phony fever is the deadlock, but uh, you get a nervous mother, you could wind up in a doctor's office, and that's worse than school. You fake a stomach cramp, and when you're bent over, moaning and wailing, you lick your palms. It's a little silly and childish, but then so is high school. What's that from? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Good. Well, we are not going to read and study again Paul's opening lines to the book of Romans. We did that the Sunday after Christmas last year. But we are at a place where Paul is ready to open a new section, um, at least He's already opened it, and he's going to step in a new direction. And these are his first words as he steps in this new direction. And I'm really fascinated by what Paul chose as his first words in this direction. For, For 11 chapters since last Christmas, Romans 1 through 11, Paul's been teaching us about the the belief system of Christianity what we are supposed to believe about ourselves and our position before God, what we're supposed to believe about the cross of Christ and how God justifies or declares righteous those who believe in Jesus, what we're supposed to believe about the hope that gives us before God if we have believed, and how we can be sure that God's going to keep every one of his promises. That's what we've been studying since last Christmas. And then chapter 12 is where Paul is ready to jump in a new direction and get practical. If you believe Romans 1 through 11, if you're a Christian, if you're justified by faith and you have the hope that Christians have in Christ, how should you be different? What are some things that I should avoid if I'm a Christian? What are some things that I should do if I'm a Christian? Paul's ready to get practical. Now, really, he's already told us everything we need to do, and he's told us how to do it. Oops, if I turn this thing on, it works. There we go. We've studied already Romans 12, 1 and 2 over the last two weeks. Here's what Paul said. Therefore, I exhort you, Christians, by the mercies of God. In other words, if you have accepted the mercy of God that I've been telling you about for 11 chapters, 
then I exhort you, I challenge you to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing. Present your bodies to God. And then Paul said, it's the only reasonable thing to do. It's your reasonable, logical worship to God because he's a better steward of my life than I am. Well, how do we do that, Paul? Well, you have to start by not being conformed to this present world. We have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to think differently. We have to see the world differently. We have to see ourselves in this world the way God does so that you can know what God wants. You'll know what is the will of God, what's good and what's well-pleasing and what's perfect to God. Everything Paul says between Romans 12, 3 and halfway through chapter 15 is how we put that into practice. And as I said, it fascinates me where Paul started. Paul is ready to tell us what it looks like to live like a Christian. If you didn't already know, if you hadn't read the book already, if I hadn't printed it on the front of the bulletin, where might you guess Paul would start? Think about that. The Apostle Paul was going to give us a list of things that should be different about Christians, what we should look like or not look like. Where would you guess he would start? Sexual immorality? He's going to cover that, but he doesn't start with it. Loving your neighbor? He's going to cover that. He's not going to start with it. Don't be a hypocrite? He's going to cover that, but he doesn't start with it. Paul only has one chance to start. Step one of being a living sacrifice and, and being different from the world in a good way is right here. This is our whole passage today. It's only one verse. This is the last week. We're only going to do one verse. Okay, we're going to start putting some... If you're sitting there thinking, like, he's going to be preaching my funeral before we get done with the book of Romans at this pace, um, we're going to add some more. But this is, this is where Paul started. Do you want to be a living sacrifice? Do you want to be different from the world in a good way? Do you want your thoughts to be filtered through the, this, I want to know what God wants for me and I want to do that? Step one today. Paul says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. But think with sober discernment as God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith. That's where we start living like a Christian. Paul begins this verse, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, this, this just lets us know this is from Paul to us all. This is a universal command. Paul has never been to Rome when he writes this. He's never met these people. So he's not, he doesn't have somebody in mind. And he says this to every one of you. So I think by extension, we can know this is whatever Christian happens to read this. This goes for me. This goes for you. And it comes from Paul. He says, by the grace given to me, I tell you what I'm about to tell you. What is the grace given to Paul? This is a grace given to Paul that's not given to everyone else. This is Paul's qualification. This is Paul's position. What was Paul's position? He was an, he was an apostle, handpicked by Jesus to be his ambassador, his, his emissary, especially to the Gentiles. And, but Paul calls that the grace given to me. What's grace? Grace is undeserved, unearned favor. Paul's about to say, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. So he calls his position the grace given to me. Paul was very clear. I am what I am only because of what he did for me. Paul didn't get to be an apostle because he had a great resume. 
right? He hated Jesus. He hated Christians. He was trying to rid the world of Christianity. It was the grace of God that would take someone like that and make him an apostle. So Paul, but Paul is pulling rank. Don't take all the teeth out of what he says here. He says, because I'm an apostle, I've got something I want to say to all of you if you want to live like Christians. And what he says is this, how you think about yourself is important. How you think about yourself is important. I, w- I want to read this again from this translation. It's a little more than what's on the, on the screen here, but listen to how many times, or see if you can pick out a word that gets repeated here that might be important. Ready? I say to every one of you not to think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, but to think with sober discernment. What word gets repeated? Think. I think we're supposed to think that how we think is important to God. That's what I think. I went to seminary to learn stuff like that. Uh, Christianity is not a brainless religion. Right? You, don't, you don't check your brain like you used to check coats when you come in here. It, it requires thought. And how we think is important to God. If we want to do this Christianity thing, how we think is important. Paul just told us that in verse 2. In verse 2, Paul said, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing of our mind starts with what we think about ourselves. I'm, I'm... I'm trying, because I'm a Christian, to give my life back to God as living sacrifice. But if I'm not careful about the way I think about myself, I won't be able to give this self back to God. Now, very obviously, this verse is kind of a warning against pride, and that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about, because this is kind of the main idea, but... Because Paul, because Paul says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, that lets us know there is a way we ought to think about ourselves, right? Right? If if he's saying, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, there has to be a way we ought to think or we can't think more highly than that. Does that make sense? So what is the way, as a Christian, I ought to think about myself? What is biblical humility? Should I, should I constantly think of myself as the worst, as the lowest, as worthless? Is that the way this works? The lower I think about myself, the happier God is with the way I think about myself. Is that the way this works? No. No. It's completely unbiblical. In fact, that just results in a different kind of self-focus, a different kind of pride. Um, We we probably could do a whole series on this. There's probably great books written on this. But I just pulled out, I think, four verses about how Christian ought to think about himself or herself. Paul said, Ephesians 2.10, Paul said this about us. We, Christians, we are God's workmanship or masterpiece this is why i showed the video before uh, this before the singing that i did with the guy reclaiming lumber i make great stuff out of old stuff that's what god does with us we are god's workmanship masterpiece craftsmanship the greek words poema so it's where we get the word poem it's something he composed it's us we've been created in christ jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. It's kind of cliche, but it's true. God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't create garbage. God creates us in Christ Jesus to be a masterpiece. We're His craftsmanship. You ought to think that about yourself. 
We are, the psalmist says, fearfully and wonderfully made. You ought to think that about yourself. God doesn't want us stuck being controlled by self-loathing and self-hatred and anxiety and fear. Because, Paul wrote to Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. God has stuff He wanted us to do, He wants us to do, and He made us adequate to do it. One more. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Paul says, we have this kind of confidence in God through Christ. Not that we are adequate just in and of ourselves to consider anything as if it were coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God who made us adequate to be servants of a new covenant. Do you you get Paul's point there? God made me. He recreated me as stuff for me to do, and he makes me adequate to glorify him in this world. We ought to believe this stuff about ourselves. We have an enemy who is very real. And the devil knows if he can keep us stuck in self-loathing and self-hatred and feelings of inadequacy and false guilt that we no longer bear, all that stuff, he knows he can keep us from being after the stuff God wants us to be about, to paralyze us. We should believe these things about ourselves. They're accurate. When I don't believe this about me, either I am right or God is right. Who do you think wins that? When you feel like you are worthless and you are unloved and nobody likes you and I think I'll go eat worms, God doesn't believe that's true about you. Who is right, you or God? We can't be used by God to do the things He wants us to do if we think we're not worth doing anything for God. So there's a way we ought to think about ourselves. That's not the main idea of this passage, but I thought it was important. We're getting closer to the main idea of this passage When we read Paul saying this, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Again, remember where Paul's at. He wants to get practical. How do we do this Christian living thing? He only has one chance to start and he starts here. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Why do you think Paul starts there? Of all the stuff he could talk about, how we ought to be different. Do you want to be different from the world, O Christian? Like in a good way? Do you want to be different from the world in a good way? Then don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. And you will be different from a world that is infatuated with self Paul knows the destructive effects of pride. It's what made him be after his job that he used to be after when he was trying to round up Christians and arrest them and kill them and all that stuff. Paul wasn't defending God. Paul was defending his own rightness. His people, his team. Have have an accurate view of yourself. Believe what God thinks about you and don't think more highly of yourself than you are. Why does he make this a universal command? Because I'm going to show you a quote here from an old Scottish preacher named James Denny who said this, to himself, every man is, in a sense, the most important person in the world. And it always needs much grace to see what other people are 
and to keep a sense of moral proportion. I love that. The natural person inside of us is so naturally selfish, self-focused, that if we're not very intentional in our thinking, we will think like we are the point. Our whole life will be after what I want, what's in it for me. It takes a renewed mind focused on Christ, trying to give myself, my body back to God to not see the world as so many opportunities for me to collect and to get what I want. To not constantly just be asking myself, asking the world, what can I do? What can I pursue? What can I accomplish that will make me feel vital and important and special and noticed? It takes that renewed mind to look out at other people in the world and say, what can I do today to make someone else feel vital and special and important and noticed? Someone else. The actual main command, grammatically speaking, comes next. It's right here. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think with sober discernment. Like, that's the main verb. Think with sober discernment. Uh, Many, maybe most of our English versions, I didn't look closely enough, don't use this word sober to translate uh, this word. It's uh, sophroneo is the the Greek word. And you know what it means? Sober. That's what it means. (laughs) But a lot of our English translators decide, man, here's what I think they decide. If we use the word sober, people are going to think of something that I don't think Paul means. When you hear the word sober, overwhelmingly, what do you think of? Just somebody who's not drunk or high, right? So I think they think, well, so let's put in sound judgment. Like, like reasonable thought, uh, sensible, sound thinking. That is what Paul is saying. Because surely Paul means, Paul means more than, as long as you're not drunk or high, then your thinking is fine. He has to mean more than that. Agreed? Here's why I chose this translation for this morning, though. I like this word in here. Because I like the connotation that of drugs and alcohol that it carries with it. You know why? Because there is nothing more intoxicating than self. There is is no drug more addictive than living my life for me. In fact, why do people start abusing drugs and alcohol? You know why? Because then I can put something in my body where I can feel good right now just locked inside of me. Everything else that's going on out there, it helps me forget and I'm okay right in here just being me. Are addicts, people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, are they others focused or do they get very self-focused? Being very self-focused is what got them to be addicts. And you want the bad news? We're all addicts to the real drug, which is me. If we'd go back into Romans chapter 1 where we started last Christmas, what's our real problem? Is my real problem the sins I have sinned? Or is the sins I have sinned, are they symptoms of a bigger problem? Do you remember what my big problem is? I made this terrible exchange. I made the swap. I have plenty of evidence to know there's a God out there that created all this. Once I have that much evidence, I should know I'm accountable to Him. I should want to know what He wants and live for Him. But I exchanged the truth that that would be my best life now, living for Him, for this lie 
that says my life would be better if I lived for me. And I am a junkie for living for Matt Maxwell. This whole Christian life is recovery. It's every day living in recovery, trying to clean up from living for me. And someone else might get stuck living for me by putting other substances in their body so I can feel good about me right now. The rest of us do it in a million other ways. But this was all our biggest problem in chapter 1. And so did Jesus save us through faith, justified by faith, so that we could keep living for me? No. May it never be. I think Paul uses this word. Paul knew about addictive substances. He's going to talk about drunkenness in this chapter. He knew it was a problem. But he uses that word with that connotation because Paul wants us to sober up. We need a long detox from the drug of self. I think that's why Paul uses that word right there. Because it takes intentional sober thinking or I will see every choice I have in my life like this. Well, what's wrong with that? You can't tell me there's anything wrong with that. You can't tell me it's wrong for me to have that and to do that. That's not sober thinking. That's that's when I'm all hopped up on me. Because I want what I want. And as long as you can't, you can't tell me there's anything wrong so I can get whatever I want and I'm not doing anything wrong. No. Sober thinking is the most reasonable thing I can do is give my whole life, body and all, to the God of the universe who saved me through Jesus Christ. And I want to see this world differently and I want to think differently. So instead of what's wrong with this is what's, what's best? How do I glorify God today? Who, who God would need, could use picked up today? God, will you show me, one, show me somebody that could, could use some encouragement today? that I could check on today. Instead of me just sitting around counting all the people who don't call me. Instead of sitting around just counting all the things I don't have that I don't want and that I haven't gotten and nobody takes care of. Sober up. And dry out. Because the truth is, when we're all hopped up and high on me, I cannot see the needs and the desires and the cares that God might want me to help meet in someone else. That's thinking with sober discernment. What helps us do this? Remembering what Paul says at the end here. Think with sober discernment. As or like, because God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith. What helps me keep my, what helps me stay dried out and sober is remembering how I, how I got in the position before God uh, that I got here. Just like Paul, it's by grace I tell you this. Why are you and I okay before God? If you are okay before God, maybe I should stop and ask, are you okay before God? When you stand before God someday, is he going to say, welcome home, my child? Or is he going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. The only way someone is right before God is if they what? The only way someone is right before God is if they have faith, believe. They believe that Jesus has already absorbed the punishment I deserve. That means if I stand before God, I'm I'm in right standing with God. There's no more condemnation. I have peace with God. 
I have it because of what Christ did for me. But I have it only because of what Christ did for me. Jesus did not just give us enough faith to save us. He gave us a faith to live by. This this measure of faith God has distributed to each of us, it's like he gave each of us a scoop full of faith that we're carrying around. That's what we live off of every day. And understanding my my standing before God is just a gift helps, helps me see the world not as so many things I can collect and get that I want and just my needs and my cares. It is just God loved this world so much that he, he sent his son to die. And this whole world, at the end of it, is going to boil down to who has believed and who has, who has worked on, in the king's payroll and who delivers his love to one another. Now, don't hear me wrong, Paul. Paul's not telling you you got to. God doesn't want you to have a job. Some of you are thinking, "Man, I got to, I got to like work." Yeah, you do. When the world was perfect, God created work, right? Created Adam and Eve. You know, He, he gave him a job. Take care of that. We call it a garden. It seemed to be more of an orchard to me, but whatever. Right? But what do I see my work as? Is it me? doing my God-designed purpose of subduing the earth under His dominion and glory. Because that's what, that's what it is. What, why does Paul start here? Opening lines are important. He only had one chance to start this section. Paul says, you want to be a living sacrifice? You want to be different from the world? And start by paying attention to how you think about yourself. How you think about yourself. How much you think about yourself. Paul knows pride is like the gateway drug of all the rest of the sins. Another reason Paul starts here is because Paul knows if we can get this, the rest of these behavioral commands are going to be a lot easier. Think about this. Um, We're not supposed to steal, right? Would people steal less if they weren't so concerned with what they don't have and what somebody else has that I don't have, right? If we thought in a more biblical, a more godly way about ourselves, would we steal less? Yes. Would uh, Would we act out less morally? If we, if we weren't so concerned about what we can get, and yes, like what you could go through all of the commands that Paul's going to give us, and he's going to give us a bunch of them. And if we did this right, a lot of the rest of that stuff would just take care of itself. If we don't see the world as a thousand different ways for me to get what I want and what I deserve. I'll treat people better. And church, this is hard. This is hard. Because the natural person within us is incredibly selfish. I lived this this week. In my own desire to be seen as the smartest guy in the room, I, I hurt somebody that I love. And I would have never done it if I would have done Romans 12, 3. We're all in recovery. We can't ever think we've gotten this one nailed. That's why Paul said elsewhere, be careful those who think you stand because we're just ready to fall. So church, do you believe in Christ. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, yes? Do you want your life to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him? Do you want to be different from the world in a good way? Do you want to think differently than you used to think so that you can know what the will of God is 
for your life, what's good, what's pleasing to God, what's perfect. Do you want that stuff in your life? Then along with the Apostle Paul, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you and to myself too, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Think with sober discernment. We can, as God has distributed each one of you a measure of faith, we cannot do, be a, a sacrifice while we're freebasing self. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Get it? Easy preaching, hard living, but by the grace of God, we can be better at this to his glory. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much that you would save a wretch like me. Thank you so much that you saved us from our selfishness. But God, you don't just turn us loose to go back into our selfishness. Our purpose is to glorify you and live for you. And we've been taught this morning, we can't do that while we live for ourselves. We can't live for you. I can't be a living sacrifice and live for me at the same time. God, renew our minds. Help us fix our thinking. Help us recover from the drug of self that we might see the needs and cares of others, that we might help others to feel noticed and feel vital and feel important and feel cared for because that's what you did for us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and finish.